Well, with no further ado, Congressman Walnick.
some of it will indeed be brick and mortar. Iron, some type of fence, some, some type of physical barrier. Some of it could be just simple patrols. Some of it can be through electronic means. We have a lot of technological advancement now with motion detection and those kinds of things where we can better understand where a lot of our vulnerabilities are. And then some of it can be done through the effective use of unmanned aerial platforms. We call them drones, but just devices that can be used to control certain areas that give us eyes on an area without the need to go to great expense to uh, construct barriers where there's not as much of a vulnerability. I don't think we're ever going to see a time when you've got a 100% uh, fail-safe system of border control. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't be striving to do things necessary to create some type of border security. I think if you do, then you can take a lot of pressure off of the interior part of the country where we are effectively having to do border security in the HR offices of a lot of business. And that's not the place that needs to happen. There needs to be an, an assumption that if somebody is in the country, that they're in the country under some legal circumstance. And we just can't guarantee that if we do not have a secure border. I feel strongly about this. I think that if you don't have a secure border, if you don't have a mentality in your country that your border is effectively secure, it makes doing all of the other things associated with comprehensive immigration reform next to impossible. Who wants to talk about E-Verify issues, or special visa programs, or other types of interior enforcement, or guest worker, or you go through the litany of things that we need to have a, a long discussion about. Who wants to talk about those things as long as there is an assumption that you do it now, and all you do is invite more to come across the border illegally anyway, and then you just compound the problem. So I think the first thing that we have to do, and this has been my position for the entire six plus years I've been in Congress, secure the border. Secure the border, then take a step back, and let's figure out what we can do as a country to be fair regarding people who have come into our country under some legal circumstance, maybe have outstayed a visa, and now are undocumented, and here under illegal circumstances, or people who just crossed illegally, or the ones that really grab your heartstrings are the parents that crossed illegally carrying an infant, not born in this country, not recognized as a citizen, but has come into the country, gone into our public school system because we will teach them, have been educated here, and have really known no other country but the United States of America. And that that is a very difficult issue to resolve to the purity of law-abiding people. They would suggest that we've got to send those people back because they're not legal citizens. I, I submit to you that if we can secure our border, it will make solving the issues of dreamers and others a lot easier to resolve. And that's why I think that we need to be committed to helping this president do what the president said he would do that led to his election, and that is build a wall. We can debate and discuss.
President uh, Trump recently signed an executive order to relax the EPA standards. Uh, I farm for a living. Now, last summer, I bought a new tractor. It's a 108 horsepower tractor, and it uses a lot of fuel. Now, it has a DEF Pat Blue on it. Are you familiar with that? Well, okay. Okay, if during the winter, when I feed hay with that, I would like to run it at 800 RPM. If I do, it's got three lights flashing on the dash, and it's got a buzzer that goes off every five minutes telling me it's going to shut down yeah. if I don't have at least 1,500 RPM on it. Okay. It forces me to use twice as much fuel as I need to use, and it also puts twice as many hours on there as I need to. It's my wish to have that taken off there and make it like the other tractors I own if I could. Okay, good. Well, uh, we're talking about government mandates uh, into, and you can, this covers a spectrum. In your case, it's, it's agriculture and it's tractors. In other cases, it's uh, standards regarding uh, efficiencies and all kinds of other, uh, other issues. But I think, personally, I think there's just way too much government. I think the government has gone overboard in trying to protect us from ourselves. And the EPA is probably the poster child for it. There are other areas, and I realize there are red cars going up. It makes it easier, it makes it easier to identify people that believe in bigger government, and the government knows more than the rest of the
When I go down to Fort Smith, Arkansas, and I, I and I have long discussions with one of my major manufacturers there, and I'll call him out by name Green, a household name in commercial heating and air conditioning. They tell me that 80 percent. Now I want you to think about this. Their R and D budget, their research and development budget, 80 percent of the cost is on compliance and not new discovery. They further tell me that they've got product lines that they are ready to introduce to the market that will create jobs and opportunity for people in the greater Savannah and Crawford County area. But for the fact that the Department of Energy is sitting on about 25, 25 rulemaking proceedings that will impact the viability of those production lines, they won't bring those lines to market. That's not America. We have to do a better job of making sure that the regulations that are coming out of Washington, D.C. are proper, that they are necessary, and if we can't, we should let the private sector continue to do what it does best, and I tell you, I have absolute belief that the private sector will do an effective job of policing its own.
Then from that budget, once approved, once the resolution is approved, then there are what we call 302A numbers assigned. This is a total number of money sent down to the appropriators for discretionary spending. Throw, um, throw number one up, Kyle. So the 302As that come out of that budget resolution basically take care of what you see in the dark shade there, those two slices in the dark shade. If you look at the whole, that whole pie, by the way, is all federal spending. And you can see that two-thirds of it is tied up in things that we call autopilot or mandatory spending. So of that $3.9 trillion budget, we're only going to allocate a little over a trillion dollars for the discretionary side of spending. So the budget resolution comes out, the 302 number is given, 302A number is given to the Appropriation Committee, and from there, that number is split 12 different ways because there are 12 different appropriations bills. That's only for one third of spending. So there will be an appropriation bill for defense. There will be an appropriation bill for labor, health, and human services and education. I serve on both of those. There will be an appropriation bill for military construction and the Veterans Administration. I serve on that one. Those are my three subcommittees. But there's one for ag. And there's one for Homeland Security. And there's one for criminal justice. And so there are 12. So the budget gets passed. The appropriators go to work. And they run their budgets. And in those budgets, based on those 302B numbers, we stay within those caps. And then we submit it to the full house for approval. Just getting those bills through committee has proven to be darn near impossible the entire time I've been in Congress. So you are right. The Congress has failed to do even the most fundamental of things that it is in charge of responsibility to do because of the divisions in Congress. And I hope that our leadership can find a way to put us back into regular order where the Budget Committee does its work, the appropriators do their work, and that we submit a, an appropriations measure that will take effect on the 1st of October on time so that we're not threatening people with CRs or worse yet, government shutdowns. Now, here's what you can expect. We don't even have appropriations for the rest of the fiscal year after two weeks from Friday. That would be the 28th of April. Funding will run out for that, what you see in blue over there. With one exception, that's military construction, because we did pass a four-year no time bill. Everything else? Including defense, it's not done. Congress is on recess this week and next week. When we go back two weeks from Monday, we'll have four days to craft a bill that will fund the rest of the government. And my guess is, if we can't do something basic like at least fund national security, it's in the Constitution, that we will be doing yet another CR and possibly a CR that will fund the government for the rest of the fiscal year. That's 2016 priorities. Those aren't 2017 priorities. Those are no new stars. So those of you that are a little worried, like I am, about what's going on in Eastern Europe, the European Reassurance Initiative that we fund in our 17 budget doesn't have money. The, the end strength that we're trying to beef up in the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and the Marines, the weapons platforms, the replacement submarine, the F-35 purchases, the F-A-18s, the things that we're trying to do that give us superiority in defense cannot be funded. So I'm with you. I think we need to do it. I'm chagrined that we have it. And I'm critical of Congress for not doing it. But we've got to fix divisions. And if we don't, and by the way, by the way, this isn't going to be a bipartisan deal unless we just do defense, because that's pretty bipartisan. The left is not going to like some of the cuts that are going to come out of the Trump administration. 
But just because, just because the president will send in a budget with some of these cuts, I, I don't want you to just automatically believe that that's going to be the, the law. Because it does have to come through the Congress, and the Congress has to decide. That's the way the system is designed to work. So, I would ask you to be patient, but I think you've been patient enough. I am expecting our Congress to do its job. And I promise you this, I'll do my part as I have for the six years I've been there. Both as a member of the Budget Committee and as a member of this appropriation. Now, before I, I'm going to go to the next question, but I'm going to throw one more slide up to kind of... Uh, put, put up number three. So, so this is part of the reason we can't do what you expect us to do. There are big divisions in Congress about this chart. That based on current law today, you can see that in 2016, our budget deficit was almost $600 million. That's the number. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Can I speak? Nearly $600 billion deficit. It goes down a little bit by 18, and then you can see the trajectory. Then in about another 10 years, we're going to have budget deficits based on current law of well over a trillion dollars a year. Now, but, but let me ask you a question, people. Who's going to pay for that? Corporation? Who's going to pay for that? No, let me tell you, let me help you who's going to pay for it. Your kids and your grandkids and probably your grandkids' grandkids. And that's a form of generational theft that needs to be fixed. There are great divisions. The left is totally oblivious to this chart. <laughs>
literally, not just figurative, literally, on land owned by the taxpayers. It was, it was not on, entirely on Shattuck's property cemetery land. Which began a, an entire series of negotiations that took place that went all the way to a conference call between Senator Bozeman and myself and the director of the National Park Service, who's got a lot of other important things on his plate, but he took time one day to visit this issue. And that out of those discussions, we have, part of this happened in 13 during the government shutdown. And the Park Service didn't have the money to help you remove the fence from their land and put it back on your land, which is what we wanted in the beginning, to reestablish the fence on the agreed upon boundary. So after the shutdown of 13, when they didn't have the money to do it, Senator Bozeman and I crafted a deal with the Park Service when the new budget came out and asked them to reconsider that offer. And they did. And they agreed, it's in writing, to take the fence down at no expense to the Shattuck Family Cemetery and put the fence back on the agreed upon property line at no expense to the Shattuck Family Cemetery. And when that offer was made, and I made it, you said to me, not good enough. And, and that came with a response from our office that said, we have negotiated in good faith, we've given you what you wanted, and now it's not good enough, we've washed our hands of it. So, upon many, many threats by the National Park Service, you guys ignore their claim that you've got to take it down or they will remove it, and at some point in time, the taxpayers of the United States have to be considered. And because you can just imagine what this is like if this repeats itself over and over and over again in our country. So you had an opportunity to do this at no expense to you, but you refused the offer. And so the Park Service has done all they could do, and that's take the fence down, stack it, and if you don't claim it, sell it for scrap. Back to you. Well. You're not telling the whole story. We built that do with park specifications. They laid it out. We built it exactly like they said for us to build it. We painted it brown just like they said. We have a signed letter from the park superintendent saying if we build this in this matter, though it's only two tenths of an acre of park land and it was only he was going to build us a white chap road access because they did not give us a handicap access in 72 when the park took the land. Right. But the park admitted in a meeting at Jasper Courthouse that they did not know who owned the 99.4 acres around the Shadok Cemetery because all of the Crow family heirs did not sign off on that in 1972. So there are 99.4 acres around the park or the Shadok Cemetery that nobody knows who owns. Park has done admit that. Well, all I can tell you, Senator Bozeman and I spent an enormous amount of time on this issue, crafting the best deal we could come up with, where at least the Shattuck Family Cemetery would be held harmless from the cost associated. And you just said that offer is refused. And so, what more can we do? Look, I have an obligation to look out for the taxpayers of the, of the United States of America, and the taxpayers own the land on which that fence partially sat. So, I wish there was more I could do. The answer to your, the original answer to your question is, can you recover the money lost between the taking down of the fence and the selling of the scrap and the original cost of the fence? Uh, look, that's going to become a civil issue between you and the Park Service, and I wish you well. Alright, who's next? Alright, All right. All right. What's your name? Yes. Uh, my name is Taylor. I'm one of the Red Park Shoulders Council. Yeah, where, where are you from, Taylor? Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, I'm from the uh, liberal bastion of Harrison. Um, <laughs> 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 you have hosted for us many times. Also, sorry, before I get started, thank you for holding this town hall. It, I think it is a good thing. Thank you. You have publicly expressed your support for defunding Planned Parenthood. And although no federal funds are used for abortion, um, in addition to providing safe legal abortions, Planned Parenthood supports women and men by providing birth control, physical exams, cancer screenings, 
excuse me. And uh, for those who might not otherwise have access to these essential services, what would be your plans for our Kansans, like myself, who might depend on these services are you, if you are successful in defunding Planned Parenthood? Well, there are many other uh, options for health care. Oh, yeah. there, there are many, there are many, <coughs> many community health centers, Karen. And, and if you look at, <coughs> if you look at, where are you? Where are you? Where there are community health centers scattered around the third district of Arkansas, so, okay, uh, where, where some of these benefits uh, do occur. Our, our issue is we don't, we don't necessarily have anything against women uh, uh, <laughs> an organization that is purposed solely on women's health, where our problem is, is under the Title X Family Planning Grants, Federal taxpayer dollars get siphoned off and generated to Planned Parenthood. Now, you may say that taxpayer funds are not used to provide abortions, but we know Planned Parenthood is the single biggest provider of abortions in this country. And I'm not, I'm not here to dispute the legality. What I'm saying is, to the majority of the people that I represent in the 3rd District of Arkansas, you're probably not in the majority in, on, this, on this particular field. People that I represent, the majority, the majority of the people I represent, do not feel the same way about your ability to have an abortion that. that I do. that we are not using taxpayer funds to terminate pregnancy. Or, second of all, or 
we could reduce the amount that we spend in our uh, in the discretionary spending of the military. We are currently the number one spender in military. The next eight nations combined spend less than us, and most of them are our allies.
the internet should not get a free pass on sales tax. I disagree that you voted for repeal of country of origin labels and repeal of everything says that make America. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. This, I took this on, and I'm not picking on the Postal Regulatory Commission, but some of these things are hard to find out. They just forced me to put them on there. But on their careers page, the first thing they list is they get compensation. Then they get health insurance, most paid by the government, it's called the Federal Employees Health Benefit. They have a federal retirement program. It's the defined benefit program that probably fits into that little scale. They have a thrift savings plan similar to a 401k, matching up to 5% of their pay. They also, the new people, get Social Security, Medicare. Now these are maybe, this is on the post oh, regulatory okay. commission, careers, federal employee. Okay, I got you. They get life insurance, federal employees group life insurance, basic coverage fully paid by the government. They have a flexible spending accounts, tax-free contributions can be for use for health care up to $5,000 or on dependent care. They have long-term care insurance. They have supplemental vision and dental. They have leave and sick leave. Their sick leave is 13 days a year. If they're there the first year to three years, they get 13 days leave. After three years, they get 20 days of leave. After 15 years, they get 26 days of leave. I'm, this is off their page. They have annual leave carryover of over 560 hours. Annual. They have annual leave exchange program, which they can receive cash in exchange for the earned leave. They have sick leave, sick leave for dependent care, which is 80 hours. They have holidays of 10 paid days. They have transit subsidy of $125 a month. And they have alternative work schedules. Now, I'm really not complaining about that. <laughs> what I'm saying is, from their compensation to their benefits, there's no max on compensation. But when you all talk about, about welfare, you talk about 100% of poverty. Arkansas's Arkansas Works is 130% of poverty. You all are going to drop it to 100% of the amount of money you can make. After that, you're on your own. Now, it's just not federal employees if you work for a corporation, if you work for a nonprofit, if you work for a partisan nonprofit, even if you're a preacher, you're losing tax subsidized money for your health care. Now, why is it when you're trying to get health care for some of those that aren't fortunate enough to be a U.S. senator or a U.S. congressman, why is it that's socialism and we're busting the budget when all these things are going on? My question is. How much money can you make a year and get no subsidies? I mean, do you make enough? Do you make enough that you can take care of your own insurance? Because you want to throw people it's under $30,000 off the health care program. All right, well, I do. So, 
And as you heard me say to the lady a minute ago, I qualify for a different program today because of my time in service, which was a commitment our, my country made to me, and I earned it. So I'm not ashamed to take it. I, I, don't know what, I don't know what that number is that you want to put up on the wall that says if you make this amount of money, you can afford it because people have different kinds of lifestyles. You do have a Because of laws, 
If we can't change those laws, there's no real hope that we're ever going to be able to see a system actually work to the benefit of the people they're purposed and working for. I, I, I know this. My limited involvement with VA is the work my staff does for people like you. We will continue to process those claims and we will continue to advocate for your circumstance to the best of our ability. Now as a member of the subcommittee, I'm hopeful of learning a little bit more about where these bottlenecks are and where these complications are so we can break down those barriers, make people accountable, and bring relief to your service. That's what we'll do. And by the way, we don't, I know a lot of you want to make me out to be this partisan hack. <laughs> with a problem. Nobody in my office is going to check what your voting card says. We don't care. Your third district are Kansas. You deserve to be treated with the highest amount of respect and diligence that my staff can give. And we pledge to you to give that to you. You're, you're upset over issues that happen when I put my card in the machine and vote. And quite frankly, it would be virtually impossible for somebody to please everybody every time you do that. I have some on the right that don't agree. I have some on the left that don't agree. The test I have for my vote, people, is, is it the right thing for 3rd District Arkansas? Is it the right thing for America? And can I sleep at night after casting this vote? Can I defend it at home with you? Not all of you, but can I defend it? And I will defend every single vote I take. Now, this gentleman right here, Said to you, no, don't me. Said, and I'll take only a second. Said something a minute ago about he didn't come to talk about. He called it fair tax. It's really not fair tax. Fair tax is a system of taxation based on a federal sales tax rate, and I think the number is twenty three percent. I could be wrong. That's the that's the fair tax that people talk about. Scrapping the IRS not taxing anything on labor instead. But, but what you're referring to is what we call e-fairness. And that is when you buy something online from a vendor out of state with no presence in Arkansas, people are getting away with those purchases without remitting the tax because the merchant doesn't collect it. It's up to the consumer to pay it to Little Rock. And that's not happening. And I have simply advocated that we level the playing field. Because I've got a lot of retail businesses in the 3rd District of Arkansas who are hardship by a tax loophole. They're losing their businesses to out-of-state businesses because of this loophole. And I know a lot of you shop online, and you like the fact that you don't have to pay your taxes. But that is simply not fair in shifting the tax burden to the people that shop downtown. And I just think that's wrong. So, with that said, all right, I'm going to let this lady speak right here. Yes, ma'am. What's your name? Harriet Farrow. Harriet? Farrow. And where are you from, Harriet? Uh, Eureka. Eureka, okay. Thank you. Um, so, one of the things I just can't get my head around, and I'd really appreciate if you could explain to me if we're all about security and keeping our nation safe, um, why does the new budget decrease spending in the State Department while increasing spending with the Defense Department? The State Department helps keep us safe before wars start, prevent wars, and I just can't figure out how you or anyone can make sense out of that idea. I, I agree with you. I agree with you. Somebody can correct me, but I want to say the skinny budget said 31% cut. Was it 31% of the state? I have a lot of people say to me, if we just quit giving money to other countries, uh, we'd be a lot better off. Uh, and you know what? In some cases, they would be right. We try, to the best of our ability, to put conditions on money that flows overseas to, to other places. But understand, this is not just money to buy national security infrastructure, although for Israel it goes largely to provide national security, Iron Dome, 
David Sling, the Arrow, those kinds of programs that keep them safe. But a lot of this money goes into places for humanitarian purposes so that America continues to retain some influence into the outcomes of these emerging societies. Now, I submit to you, the reason I agree with you is because I firmly believe that where America doesn't assert leadership and buy some consideration with its money, somebody is going to plug in behind us. And those somebody's throw uh, six, what is it, six or seven? So the people that would like to see us continue to unplug around the world are depicted up here on this slide. And, and, and so, my, so, so this drives a lot of my decisions over whether or not I believe we should be incre increasing our ability to provide better national security. Weapons platforms, in restraint, that's people, and force structure, where we have units and what type of units we have, because it is an unsettled world. If we unplug from all these other places around the globe, here's who's coming in behind us. And I'm going to tell you, people, we're, we're a, a relatively a small country. We're 330 million people. There's another 7 billion people around the globe. If we just put a wall up around our country, yeah, we can, we can produce enough food to feed us, and we can make things to provide for us, but a whole lot of people that are in business in our country don't just do business with the United States of America. 95% of the rest of the trading world is outside our borders. So we have, to be, we have to be mindful of the fact that we've got to have some influence in these foreign territories, and that means we've got to have a portion of our budget dedicated to that. But it's about 1%. So I'm with you. I think that we've got to be very careful not to unnecessarily cut state and foreign operations to the extent that we have some of these rogue nations coming in behind us and taking our place. We can go into much greater detail. I won't do that, but I, I, I appreciate you bringing that up. Now, having said that, it's not just state and foreign ops. It's labor, health, and human services. The skinny budget also said we're going to cut $6 billion out of the National Institutes of Health. Now, that's insane. It's insane. And here's why it's insane. What they do at the NIH, and I'm the vice chair of the subcommittee, what they do at the NIH may not seem important to you, but for some, but for some people, for some people, it's their only way to survive because of the clinical trials that are going on in a lot of these hardcore diseases. But more importantly, financially, if you look at the curve on Alzheimer's, and folks, there's a bunch of us in here that are going to be candidates for an awful disease. It'll shorten lifespans, but the, the cruelty of that disease, not just to people and caregivers, but to the economy, is in the trillions of dollars. I think, let me finish, I think... <laughs> that cutting $6 billion out of the National Institutes of Health will affect our ability to make inroads to critical research for, dis for, for memory programs like Alzheimer's that could be a billion dollars spent here today that could save trillions of dollars in the outcome. But we do have to find a way to make this budget work so that we're not pounding more debt and deficits and debt on these young people that are going to be asked to pay for it. All right, let's let's go right here in the middle. Yes, ma'am. What's your name? My name is Suzanne Wall from Jasper. Suzanne from Jasper. Okay. Now, is are you in Newton County? That is in the third district. Or yes. You? Okay. I'm Paul Washington. Fine. Doesn't make any is, difference. But I just Jasper is split. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to ask. Um, I wish the Republicans and Democrats would work together instead of saying the other side. I think they need to be a better compromise. Second. I said I think that everybody should want to compromise on, on the issues that can be compromised. I agree with you. Is that true? Second. Well, I wish you would compromise more. <laughs>
compromise. That was a Henry Clay specialized in compromise. And Ronald Reagan was pretty good at it. Ronald had tipped. Ronald, Ronald had tipped to work with. He didn't have an answer. Um, I consider this to be the, the biggest threat to the republic as we know that we have allowed our country to get so polarized. Now, I don't. I had this conversation today with with some people in healthcare. And the question was asked, what can we do to get the Congress, which is, is bicameral, out Senate, but in each chamber, bipartisan, Republican and Democrat. How do we get them to maybe work a little bit toward reaching across the aisle and working together? And we aren't there. I don't need to tell you that you see it every day. On the Republican side, if I may, it's kind of a three-headed monster, okay? It is what we call the Tuesday group. You hear that reference a lot, but that's the moderate wing of House Republicans. I don't know, uh, 40 maybe, 30 or 40 people. Now, these people come from Pennsylvania, Indiana, the Rust Belt, Ohio, up New Jersey, New York. These are Republicans in traditionally blue states. They are the true majority makers of the House Republican Conference because if they get beat, they get replaced by a Democrat. Okay? Then to the right of the Tuesday group is a large group of people, the center right to a little further right Republicans, known as the Republican Study Committee. And that's a large number of people. And I kind of consider myself kind of on the left side of that group and on the right side of the Tuesday group. I'm a center-right guy. I try to be center-right in most of my people. But that's a big number of people there. Between the two, you have the ability to do about anything you want to do because you can get 218 votes most of the time. To the right of the Republican Study Committee, the third head is the House Freedom Caucus. And I don't need to tell you who those people are. I'm not one of those. The House Freedom Caucus is a group of about 40 people who can kill a Republican bill by themselves that have a rule that if 80% of the group don't like something, none of them like it. And so you've got to negotiate. Speaker Ryan has to negotiate with the House Freedom Caucus if he wants to get something done. Because in mass, they can bring a bill in, as they have. So here's the conundrum. How does the Speaker of the House get something passed when either the far right or the far left of his own conference can kill a bill by itself. So it's like the balloon. You, you kind of work over here to try to appease some of the freedom ears, and you lose moderates. You work further with the moderates, and you lose the freedom caucus. The only way this is going to be fixed, it's one of three things. And if some of it lies with you. The demands that people will have on their members to bring the two sides to kind of check their agendas and their egos at the door and force them to work together. I don't see that happening. The other scenario would be, God forbid, a cataclysmic event that unites a country. We saw this at 9-11. This happened at 9-11. It didn't last long. And 9-11 was a long time ago. We've changed a lot since then. But that... A, a, a bad event has a tendency to bring people together and forget their differences politically. The third and most likely scenario is that Donald Trump, the President of the United States, who really doesn't belong to either party. Okay. In the way, or in the White House. I think we have to be honest with ourselves. He, you know, he, run, he runs on the Republican ticket, but Donald Trump has enormous popularity with a lot of people, particularly people on the right, because he ran as a Republican. I think the key is Donald Trump 
basically saying to the American electorate and to the body politic, we've got, we've got to work here together. And I think if Donald Trump will begin the process of bringing the two sides together, we have a chance to do that. So now, you're not talking about right? You're talking about how we're No, no, no. Not, not, not He's already tried that. He tried that on health care. Oh, it didn't work. Okay. I, I, I'm just saying that Mr. Trump has the ability to bring forth ideas and proposals and cause the two sides to be together. Now, let me give you an example. I know, I know you're naysayers. That's your nature. I never saw it, well, after Vietnam, I never thought I'd see the day that we would have 13 to 20 people in support of a minuscule combat arm. That, we had enough of that in Vietnam, at least I did. I had an in-country tour, PBRs and PCS. Now, it seems to me that we're going in the wrong direction when we consider so anything other than getting rid of some of our admirals, we've got too many of them. Secondly, we need to have more ships and more sailors. Ships belong at sea, sailors belong on ships. You don't learn to run a ship flying through the halls of the Pentagon or driving a mahogany table in the Pentagon. And right now, we've got too many horses that are pulling in different directions, We've got ships that can't get underway. We have ships that when they get underway, they can't get back home. Well, 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 literal command ships. You know the ones to which you refer. Yes, sir. We have a modern destroyer that has no visual signaling capability. If they were to go into radio silence, or if they were to lose the satellites, they'd have no means to communicate with an ambassador. Stupid. Designed in Washington to be built somewhere where there's the most political pull, as with bath and frigates that never were on their mind. I can't slip into sailories. But finally, I managed to serve in a rather varied career in two embassies. And what I learned is there's no such a thing as diplomacy. Diplomacy is war in the beginning. And when diplomacy fails, they send in the troops. Right now, we've got more troops being sent in without the benefit of a declaration of war than we've ever had. I was in 41 years. I'm classified as a World War II veteran. I've only served in one war. I've been shot at several times. 
but I guarantee you there was no declaration of war. Congress denied its responsibilities with the War Powers Act. Finally took a good look at that, my young man. I agree. Anger's away.
there is chaos and there is limited opportunity to properly vet people before they reach the home. So we, we have it. Now, if you sit down and talk to the Canopy organization, as I have, they now understand that I'm not opposed to refugees. As a matter of fact, I sat Sunday night, as many of you did, and watched 60 Minutes and saw the piece on, I think he was from Turkey, uh, Chobani, the Chobani Yogurt Company, and the fact that here's a guy that came as a refugee and has, because he had a dairy background and because he took a risk on a yogurt plant and got some private capital and backing, he was able to provide a world brand company now worth billions of dollars and he's given equity interest to the people that helped him build that. We need more people like that. And we need, we need people that come into our country as refugees or as just regular immigrants that come in the right way to help teach us a little bit about what it's like to truly be in America. Because I'm going to tell you something, folks. Like it or not, most of us take it for granted. No. No. Oh, yeah, yeah, we do. We take it for granted. We don't, we don't think about the billions of other people around the globe that would love to trade places with us. And sometimes the biggest crisis that we have as people is when we lose our data on our smartphone. And that's not a crisis. We have, there are people around the world that are starving for American ingenuity and American, and, and some of the American dream that, that we know how to, how to create. But we become very selfish and very drawn in our, in our own personal lives. It's a fact. Okay? And particularly the kids that we're bringing up right now. They have no idea what real hardship and sacrifice is, no matter what their living condition is in this country. I'll just say it that way. All right, let's go right here. Just me. What's your name? Tracy Coffey. Tracy. Where are you from? Bull Shoals. Bull Shoals. One of my favorite places. One of my favorite places. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you for being here this evening. We do appreciate yes, that. A couple, just a couple of quick comments. And one is that there's a really big difference between big government and government overspending. And it would really be worthwhile for somebody to take a look at all the waste that goes into our government. <laughs> <laughs> Save babies that we won't let in our country, and I know that's a whole other thing. I wanted to ask you, you were just talking about starving people. In Arkansas, there are more than 22,000 homeless children. We have the third highest rate of child homelessness in the United States. That's not a good statistic. Um, Benton and Washington counties in the last couple of years have seen a 116% increase in the number of homeless children. How do you define homeless, by the way? Can you give me a... Um, um, I, I can get you the it's, it's not. It's not what, what, folks. I'm sensitive to it, okay? I don't, I don't, I've got two grandkids. I don't want to see anybody homeless any more than you do. But to be fair, the, the homeless definition does include people who live with other family members, okay, that may not it's be... It's by and large people who have no further state or housing. Yeah. But the, the people can, I'm most concerned about are the people that, that have no place to go at all. Those would be the most vulnerable. <laughs> <important. laughs> and, and there are a lot of those. And there are. And yes, I, work, I work with children, so this is a big deal for me. And in living this, in a car and those kinds of things. I got yes, it. Um, living in parks. So, in the Trump skinny budget, um, one of the proposed cuts is $6 billion to HUD. That includes a decrease of about $300 million for Section 8 housing, which is not just housing for families. That includes uh, vouchers for homeless veterans. That's a decrease of $42 million for Section 2 housing as assistance for the elderly. A decrease of $29 million for Section 811 housing, which is housing assistance for the disabled and reducing the Native American housing <coughs> block grants by $150 million. That would have a huge impact on people of Arkansas. So really what I want to know from you is what are you going to do to fight for our Arkansas children and the elderly and the disabled and the veterans who cannot fight for themselves? Okay, well, what you talk about is in the school budget. Submits his skinny budget with certain cuts.
cuts are trying to pay for some increases in some other areas. You know, just because a skinny budget is proposed does not mean that that's going to be the law. It's got to go through both chambers of Congress. So it'll get reviewed, and, and, and that's a skinny budget. We won't get the full budget until sometime in mid-May. We get the full budget. It will come before the budget committee. We'll take it up. There will be changes. It will go. Okay. But, There is probably a more significant chance of some of those cuts making it through than possibly ever in the past. Oh, I suppose you're right. Except you guys forget the fact that <laughs> you guys. You guys. <laughs> and some guy, and some guys. But I use I use guys kind of interchangeably. <laughs> so you guys and you guys and you. Four granddaughters. 
grandchildren and my grandchildren are in this community, how are we going to support them in our state? How are you going to support them in our government? And I would like to know how you're going to support our private, or would you support a private investigation with President Trump in this Russian <laughs> I love you. 